Africa Inland Mission has been sending missionaries to Africa since 1895. Right from the beginning, Canadian AIMers have lived and died for the sake of the gospel. But it wasn't until 1953 that AIM established its headquarters in Toronto. This year, AIM Canada celebrates its 60th anniversary. I'm proud to introduce to you some of our pioneers, Canadian missionaries who heeded God's call to establish Christ-centered churches among all African peoples. The first Sunday I sat in church and wept with joy because he allowed me to go to Africa to serve him. And I mean, I don't figure I had many abilities. And then I realized it was my helplessness that was most valuable. When we first joined the mission in 52, we were actually joined through the American office because there was no Canadian office. I did not want to be a teacher because I thought, I can't spell, so um, I chose nursing. It was a journey of 44 days, and the second day out, it was rough, and I remember sitting on my bunk and thinking, what am I doing? What kind of a decision have I made? <laughs> When I went into a village, I would gather the people together, as many as I could. And uh, one day I started out and I said, do you know who Jesus is? And this woman with her most beautiful face looked up at me and said, no, we don't, you tell us. During our last 10 years in Kenya, when we were in Nairobi, my job was as a natural family planning practitioner. Some of our uh, pastors, evangelists, used to say that a missionary who knew the language well was a missionary who had a djembe. The word djembe is a Swahili word that describes the African whole. They said all missionaries have gardens, but not all missionaries have a djembe. The missionaries who master the language have a djembe they can cultivate, they can change people's lives. One of the philosophies of AIM was to train nationals to do your work so that you weren't needed. And so I spent 35 years training nationals to be nurses. And when I finished, when I uh, left Tanzania, the principal, and the vice principal, and all of the teachers except one had been trained at Kolondoto. When the people thought, if our kids get an education, they can get a good job, then the communities were always at our door trying to get us to come to their place and start a school. And so what we did was we said, okay, you put the building up and we'll, we'll send a teacher. So we started in a way, I mean, the Lord started hundreds of churches eventually because of the, these schools. I did adult literacy, village evangelism, taught in a Bible school, a high school, many of those went ahead to become pastors and leaders. We had a measles outbreak and 3,000 babies came in one month and we received the measles vaccination. I think AIM, right from way back in those years, was on the cutting edge. Their whole philosophy when it came to ministry and the family was very important to us. Yes, we put God first, but we put God first in our lives by being a good husband, by being a good wife, uh, by being good fathers and, and mothers. And uh, we must never carry on ministry at the expense of our children. And that, uh, that really attracted us to AIM. I am just a nurse. Uh, there were no doctors. And when a doctor came once a month, 
but the people were so wonderful. No one ever asked me if I knew what I was doing because I didn't. But we prayed a lot and we read a lot of books and um, uh, God, God answered prayer. And um, people were healed and that is a miracle, believe me. We worked in the Christian Ed Department and began a program where the girls would learn things like housewifery and Bible studies and good citizenship and health things. Well, it was nighttime, it nearly always was. So we had to take kerosene lantern with us. So I had to walk in between two warriors, one in front, one behind with spears to protect us from the animals. And when I got used to the dark, I saw every woman in the village sitting along the wall, just watching to see if I knew what I was doing. The dear women of the village would say, please, will you pray? I said, I've been praying ever since I got here. Every extended family in our village, there were about 5,000 people, had somebody in their family who died of AIDS. We began to train community health workers, local ones, to go into the village and counsel the families where somebody had AIDS. Many of them came to know Christ because of this. My husband and I served in Tanzania and then Kenya for 27 years. In Tanzania, we were there to do a mission among the island people. Don went to many of the islands. He always had a heart for the church and pastors. I ran a dispensary on Ukata and then I would go over there and work from about 9 to 12 seeing sick people. I think one of the most critical needs that we saw was the need for a Christian family living instruction. Most, I would say, of their children were not believers, had lifestyles that were very different from what we would consider a Christian lifestyle. And then another one that was very critical was the need for responsible management of the church's resources. Sometimes we see in Africa a church that lacks maturity. And so we need to build up the believers. Our Kalenjin Christians were good at sharing Christ with their fellow Kalenjins, but they were very unwilling to step over the borders and reach out to their enemies with the love of Christ. So we worked on ways to help improve that. They saw in us people who really respected their culture. People who were so fascinated and excited about their wonderful language. Every Sunday we would be out in some church uh, preaching in Kikamba and uh, that, that was how it took a little bit of work <laughs> during the week. Uh, but it helped us get to know the people and to be friends with the people. And once you can speak their language, you're home free. And I think it was our appreciation for them that resulted in them wanting to help us to really fulfill everything that God had called us to do. I went to work with the Maasai people. I think they're fantastic, they're wonderful people. They were very kind to me. They uh, wore just one cloth over one shoulder and they all carried spears and they were very warlike. And so when I looked out of the window at a clinic, I saw a row of spears outside and I just said, thank you God that they're my friends. I fully believe that a Kalenjin person coming from their culture is not disadvantaged at all in being able to understand the gospel, the, the critical parts of the good news about Jesus. They had the concept that it is through the shedding of blood that there is cleansing from sin. So they understand the atonement in a fuller sense 
than what most Westerners would be able to understand. And we present Jesus as the sacrifice for man's sins. They can fully comprehend that. Women were not considered to be of any importance. And so I taught them that they were precious to God, God loved them, and that Jesus Christ died for them. I had a little typewriter and I kept a, a letter in it all the time. And if I had five minutes, I sat down and did another paragraph and kept in touch with folks at home. And, but it takes three weeks or more to get a letter. Our second term when we were on Ukata Island, Dawn's mother passed away and then my dad passed away. And we just kept on with our work. But um, when we came home again, then we had to go through the process of grieving. The trees had been destroyed, and I was very cross with the school children until I was told it was 12 elephants, no, six elephants in my yard, a couple of yards from my door, and they had eaten the trees. And, uh, I like animals, but at a distance. <laughs> we were based at Kahunda on the boat. I had two children born during that first term. It was quite, a, quite an experience to to do that on a boat that was moving most of the time. I would have paid to be there, please. I thought it was the most wonderful privilege in my whole life that God should allow me to be working for him with his help in Africa. And I, I loved it, I really did. Oh.